Science Report. What's new in science? What's news in science? Industry, research, study, experiment. Marvels of an age in which science is man's hope for the future. Science can be a new fire engine. A gas turbine motor running super hot. Something not tried on a vehicle like this before. Weighing a tenth as much as the usual engine. Tried out at Elmira, New York, the new type engine develops 350 horsepower, zooming from a standing start to 50 miles an hour in 31 seconds. Backseat driver for the swing shift. Future cars may try these turbine engines. They burn almost any fuel, make car maintenance simpler. The engine, called the Turbo Chief in the firefighter version, proved up to any challenge. Jet age turbines for modern firefighting. A sky high satellite system to carry tomorrow's communications load. This Bell telephone exhibit shows how the system will work. Signals bounce off relay satellites circling the Earth, jump huge distances. Long distance telephone traffic is expected to rise enormously in the next 10 years. Calls across the Atlantic alone will increase seven times. A series of satellites in orbit, one coming along when another goes out of range, can help to carry them. They even could carry television pictures around the world. A car that thinks for itself. Belgian garage owner Alphonse de Jonker added the automatic gadgets to a Chrysler Imperial in his spare time. She can leave the wheel alone. The car slips out of a parking space sideways by itself. Retractable rollers do the job, but this is only the beginning. The brakes go on automatically, headlights adjust themselves, and an automatic jack simplifies tire changes. Radar pilots the automobile. When it senses an obstacle, on go the brakes. Here's the radar screen. And a feeler antenna for city driving at close quarters. The robot pilot lives in the trunk. Includes a radio sender and receiver to open the garage door. The car will obey its master's voice, start the engine, and drive up to him. Builder de Jonker says his car is safe. And it doesn't tell you how to drive, it drives for you. Science investigates mother love, and these are mothers. The only mothers a group of baby monkeys at the University of Wisconsin ever knew. Psychologist Harry Harlow tried to find out some of the basics of love whether we love what feeds us or what cuddles us. Cuddling one. Given a choice, the monkeys preferred the cuddly cloth mother. They got no comfort from the wire mother who fed them. Then Dr. Harlow frightened some of the monkeys. Again, the cloth mother symbolized reassurance for baby monkeys. Now an unfamiliar situation for the monkey to cope with. A large room with strange objects. When mother wasn't there, the monkey, like a human baby, was afraid. Now the same room, but with the cloth mother there. The frightening things were not so frightening anymore. From these and other experiments, Dr. Harlow concluded that the cloth mother substitutes were as good, or perhaps better, than a real mother. They were never punishing, never denying, always comforting. 
The monkeys seemed to feel that mother loved them. The wire mother was no help. The frightened monkey just rocked itself and cried, its behavior resembling that of neglected human children in and out of institutions. The monkeys would go to great lengths to get to their cloth mother. But for all the love the monkeys showed for their cloth mother substitutes, all was not as well as it might seem. For when the monkeys grew up, although they were perfectly healthy, they were strange. Raging at passers-by or biting at themselves, they were unsocial. Some were completely withdrawn. And they did not know how to make love to other monkeys, even with normal ones. Dr. Harlow thinks perhaps some hostility from a real mother is necessary for a monkey to learn how to love. And for monkey or child, a real mother has something that a substitute lacks, no matter how warm and cuddling. How to talk to a machine. Use the new apt language and let a computer translate. The system opens new frontiers in automation. Donald Ross, a scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, is the inventor. At the present time, we cannot use ordinary English for programming the apt system. Here is an example of the actual language of the present apt system. For instance, line one is a line through point A at an angle of 90 degrees with the x-axis. Similarly, tool motion can be given, as we see down here. Go forward along the circle whose center is at point A and whose radius is four inches. In this way, the geometry and tool motion can be described. APT stands for APT, for Automatic Program Tool. Now, an IBM computer translates from APT into the number language the automatic machine tool can understand and obey. Before apt, it would have taken hundreds of hours to translate the human instructions into machine terms. Now, the complicated path the automatic machine must follow to chisel the design in steel. And the punched tape with the instructions the machine will obey. The finished product is an ashtray. It could just as easily have been an intricate part for any machine. The scientists say apt is an engineering breakthrough. People now can use machines to give orders to other machines. The Great Lakes, which form part of the border between Canada and the United States, once produced millions of pounds of food annually. Lakes fisheries provided employment for many thousands of Americans and Canadians living along the coastlines. But in the past 15 years, this picture has vastly changed. Lake Michigan fishermen brought five and one half million pounds of trout to market in 1946. Today, Michigan trout have all but vanished. Reason for their disappearance has been no mystery to biologists of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The culprit, the lamprey. The lamprey eel, which leeches onto a fish and literally bleeds off its life with its sucker-like mouth. The lamprey is a sea creature by nature and once migrated into fresh water only to spawn and die like the salmon. But in Lakes Huron and Michigan, it has become landlocked. And without the limitless food supply of the open ocean, its depredations have created a major problem. Spawning takes place in the spring, with the female releasing as many as 200,000 eggs. 
both parents die soon afterwards. But in 10 to 20 days, the eggs hatch into toothless larvae, which burrow into the mud for three or four years. When they are four to six inches long, they go down to the lakes, where they live off the blood of the fish to which they cling. To combat this menace is a gigantic task. Biologists have attacked the lamprey with various weapons. One is the construction of weirs to trap the migrating eels and destroy them in large numbers. But enough lampreys get through to maintain the population. Another means is electricity. Electrodes suspended in the streams create fields strong enough to stop the lampreys. These have the added advantage of being cheaper to construct and maintain. Fish are not affected by the fields, and though some lampreys get through, many are killed. In ancient times, lampreys were considered a great delicacy. They are still eaten even today in some of the Baltic states and in some sections of the New World also. But in most kitchens, they are not very popular. Most promising weapons in the battle against the lamprey are chemicals. To find a poison which would kill the parasite without harming fish, biologists have tested more than 5,000 compounds. One of them has proven highly efficient. Over the next five years, this poison will be seeded into all lamprey spawning streams on Lakes Michigan and Huron. Ten years from now, we may know how successfully this three million dollar battle has been waged. Then it is hoped there will be good fishing again on and around the Great Lakes. Science's amazing maser, a new device to amplify light. A glowing tube filled with neon and helium puts out a beam of infrared light. It vibrates at a pure frequency. Since the light waves are all in step, they can be used the same way we now use radio waves. And since light waves vibrate millions of times faster than radio, this maser beam could carry much more information than a radio beam. And the beam is so tight that it could be sent 100 miles using a telescope for an antenna and still be only a foot wide. The Bell Lab scientists in New York repeated telephone inventor Alexander Graham Bell's historic words in their first phone call via the Maser. Come here, Dr. Watson, I need you. Today's toys to train tomorrow's scientists. They start them young a mobile model of the solar system, kits of all kinds that let children do their own experiments, Geiger counter sets to miniature computers. The Science Material Center in New York even offers scientific songs for children to sing and to learn from. Zoom a little zoom in a rocket ship off we go on a trip, heading for the moon at a rocket clip. We're gonna zoom, zoom, rocket. Soon we'll see if the moon is made out of green cheese. Ha, 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 ha. Zoom, we're here at the moon. Let's see what the moon is like. Grade school pupils do experiments. Spinning a pinwheel with static electricity magnetic lines of force, and the nature of magnetism. 
It's a scientific fact. A scientific fact. It has to be correct. It has to be exact. Because, because it is, because it is a scientific fact. It's a scientific fact. A scientific fact. It has to be correct. It has to be exact. Because it is, because it is a scientific fact. Scientific songs and toys to learn by. Los Angelinos picket against smog. Nobody likes dirty air, smog or smaze or just old-fashioned smoke. But we live in cities. We burn things, coal, oil, gasoline for heat, for power, for transportation. And the air in the cities is polluted. The smog variety of air pollution results from the effect of sunlight on unburned hydrocarbons. Los Angeles turns out 1,200 tons of them a day. It can make you cry. It can make you angry enough to protest. It could make you ill. London's air is polluted another way. Coal smoke from living room fires mixed with thick fog. The British call it the killer fog. In California, the scientists have confirmed that smog can hurt crops. Smog created in a laboratory. A little bit of poison in a million parts of air. This is what it did to the plants. But clean air costs money, hundreds of millions in Los Angeles alone. Oil refineries there now emit mostly water vapor instead of the smog-producing hydrocarbons. For coal-burning plants, electrostatic precipitators to trap smoke particles. Here is the result with one. A matter of seconds, and smoke virtually disappears. California will require exhaust eliminators for new cars soon. Other states may follow. This is one experimental exhaust eliminator. It feeds ozone into the cylinders for more complete combustion. With the device turned off, this is what you get. Then, with the exhaust eliminator turned on, cleaner air for the modern age. The science of anthropology and the sound of the Aturi rainforest in the Congo. And these are the children of the forest, the Bambuti pygmies, living much the same life as when we first heard of them 4,000 years ago. An Egyptian general wrote one of the fourth dynasty pharaohs that he had found a singing people. This is one of their hunting songs. A morning's hunt usually gives them food enough for the day. In their forest camp, then, they can rest, eat, and play. For clothing, they use tree bark, which they make into cloth. Anthropologist Colin Turnbull of the American Museum of Natural History lived with the Bambuti and made these films. When a girl is ready for marriage, the women sing this song. A suitor, aided by his friends, makes a mock attack upon her family's hut. If he wins his way into the hut, the couple may become engaged. 
A pygmy girl is ready for a wedding ceremony in a nearby Negro village. The Nilotic and Sudanic Negroes fought their way into the area several centuries ago. They like to say they own the pygmies, and the pygmies play along by providing the bride and groom for the ritual wedding ceremonies. But even though they dance and sing for the Negroes, the village rituals do not mean much to them compared to their own forest customs. marriage made in the Negro village may or may not last in the forest, but the pygmies keep the wedding presents anyway. In the village, the pygmies let their boys be initiated in the Negro ritual. One of the Negroes, dressed as a sacred bird, leads the dance. The pygmy boy follows. And again, the pygmies enjoy the gift. The pygmies trade with the Negroes, but in case of trouble, they retreat to the forest. The Negroes fear it. The pygmies are at home there. Now, a story of how the pygmies trick the foolish villagers. <laughs> The honey hunting season is a happy time for the pygmies. They have special honey hunting songs. The pygmies really are children of the forest. They've seen the roads build into it. And the pygmy says, when the forest dies, we will die. Children of the forest, when untimely death or misfortune does strike the pygmies, they do not feel it as evil. They feel that the forest, their protector, has fallen asleep. And they sing one of their Molimo songs to waken it. It means, if there is darkness, then darkness must be good. Americans take water for granted, but experts estimate that in 15 years, Americans will be using all the water they have available, and many areas of the United States will be running short. The really arid regions of the world today show what life is like without water, or with a pitifully small supply. Water could make all the difference in the world here. Many regions of the world facing water shortages may never have to cope with conditions like this. But the United States has already experienced water shortages. In the dry summer of 1957, 1,000 cities and towns had to restrict water use. At one point, New York City's reservoirs, this is one of them at that time, were down to 60% of capacity. Another dry year, with more population and larger industry, and such shortages could really hurt. One solution to the problem is being tried on the Dutch island of Aruba off the coast of Venezuela. Natural water is just about nil. But there is one source of supply. All the water in the world. 
but salt water. In Aruba, they turn salt water into fresh, tapping that inexhaustible reservoir. The distillation plant, built by the Weir Company, turns out 2,700,000 gallons of fresh water a day, all the island's drinking supply. It is one of the most efficient desalting plants in the world today, producing fresh water at a cost of $1.75 a thousand gallons. Other parts of the world have salt water conversion plants, but the cost must be brought down if the world is to make up its fresh water deficit from the sea. For it's fresh water that brings life. Makes things grow. In Israel, another water short region, they're also experimenting with seawater. At the Negev Desert Research Institute, seawater and brackish water is being used for irrigation. According to their experiments, it's possible to grow 200 species of plants in this way. But for most of the world's future water deficit, conversion of salt water into fresh seems the only answer. In the United States, where the government is sponsoring water conversion research, the General Electric Company has developed a new distillation process. This laboratory model was built in Burlington, Vermont, and features revolving blades that spread the water in a thin film for evaporation. The ancient, ancient sea and a modern, urgent need. This is a task for science. 